Hello traders, happy new years. It is Tuesday, January the 4th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you a rundown of the opening 24 hours of the trading year, and more importantly, an analysis for what we can expect in the next 24 to 48 hours as liquidity starts to ramp up into 2022. Now, things are relatively thin still in trading, even though we've turned the corner from 21 to 22, uh, and that's to be expected, uh, but there is certainly a thin liquidity, which has amplified some of the volatility in certain areas of the market. We opened up this new trading uh, week with a record high Dow, uh, although it was very consistent in trade for Monday. Uh, we also had a surge for the U.S. dollar. Uh, there were, That would have... Uh, cascading influences on other areas of the market, including gold, which had a, an enormous decline. Uh, but none of these moves, I would really say, is indicative, meaning I don't think that there's something to extrapolate in terms of trend. We're still dealing with liquidity. Liquidity remains the number one concern for me uh, when it comes to trading these markets, but there's plenty of technicals, there's plenty of fundamentals uh, that will come into their own as the markets uh, fill out. But when should we uh, determine or how do we determine uh, when things are going back to quote unquote normal? We'll talk about that in today's video, but before we get too far into it, let's take 10 seconds, look over the disclaimer. Once we're on there, we'll dive right into it. Okay, so the first place I'm going to start is risk trends. Uh, now, when I say risk trends, I usually reference a, a specific measure, and I think that's for convenience sake. Most of us do this. Uh, but when I'm really looking at risk trends, I'm looking across the board at a range of assets in different regions around the world. And the reason we do this is because it is very easy to get captured in the specific performance of a very uh, very narrow market and, ex and assume that that's the, uh, the general course, the setting, and the tempo of the entire financial system. And it's not. It's important to, to take ourselves out of it every now and then and to look at the big picture by looking across uh, the spectrum and to look at it a different way instead of just the relative performance of various assets. Uh, if you look at risk in terms of a scale or a spectrum, then you can also look at it as an intensity measure, kind of like a barometer. The stronger the barometer, uh, the more indicative it is that there is a consistency that we can rely on. As of right now, I haven't updated this gauge, but we're probably down here. There is not a lot of risk on, risk off to be deriving from these markets, which is natural for the time of year. So with that said, the Dow. The benchmark U.S. index, the value index relative to the growth index of the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 uh, managed to hit a new record high. All right. New record high close, not an intraday high. That was on the 30th. Uh, now, that record high was not uh, reflected in the NASDAQ 100, but it did also just barely uh, win it out on the S&P 500, as you can see here. Um, the NASDAQ 100, though, a little shy, but not far. A little, uh, a, 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 just a, a stretch to get there. Now, in terms of the NASDAQ relative to the Dow a ratio that I often look at, I will continue to look at this year, the relative uh, growth to value measure, that ratio is still pulling back from basic extreme. Remember, if you do it on a monthly chart, you can see that we are coming off of the dot-com boom bust record high. And that is a qualitative measure of risk trends. It's not necessarily the quantitative one. Uh, quantitative, yeah, we managed to notch a new record high. Now, this is interesting because not the, not the entire market was open, all right? And certainly not the entire spectrum of risk-based assets were uh, conforming to this conviction. In fact, if I look at the S&P 500, actually, let's take it to the E-mini futures, uh, and you put it down to a 15 minute chart. Yeah, we'll go 15 minutes. You'll see that there's a lot of inconsistency uh, through the opening trading day of the year. All right, so it wasn't a lot of charge of enthusiasm. Uh, it just it managed to squeak out a gain. Now, if you look at some of the other uh, regions around the world, the DAX, uh, the German Equity Index, opened with a strong advance. Uh, but if you go to the, the UK's FTSE 100, you actually didn't have an open session. Uh, the same is true if you go to uh, the Nikkei 25, so Japan. 
all right, not open. Much of Asia was actually closed uh, in observation of Saturday's New Year's Day holiday. All right, and this would, again, keep liquidity very sparse. You would see that liquidity uh, fairly restrained in the Spider ETF, the S&P 500's uh, principal derivative. Uh, you can see that volume did pick up. It was higher relative to the past week and a few days uh, worth of holiday trade, but it's still holiday trade oriented. All right, so we're not really getting a earnest reflection of risk. You would also see that other risk-based assets that were actually open on the day were not conforming to the same degree of enthusiasm. Emerging markets, this is the uh, ETF. Uh, you can also see this emerging market currencies. The junk bond ETF, HYG, uh, would have a pretty strong open to the year. This is repositioning uh, in exposure, uh, but it wouldn't have consistent uh, risk on. And crude oil as a commodity with risk orientation would similarly not show much in the way of enthusiasm. You can also look at the FX market. Carry trade actually started the year lower. And it wasn't just the Aussie and you have Kiwi and CAD yen and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so a pullback of capital uh, to uh, its origination. So an inconsistent picture of risk trends, uh, which really should throttle our enthusiasm for the Dow notching that record of the S&P 500, notching that technical record. Now, now this could change, uh, obviously, uh, if we get liquidity as it fills back up through the rest of the week, and it will take uh, probably the full week to get back up to liquidity. But I would say that it's important to remember that the first week of the year, using the representative of the S&P 500, is typically the strongest uh, in the 52-week calendar, uh, going back to 1900 for this benchmark. All right, so you have that potential, you have the capacity, uh, but liquidity is still very much a constraint in how it's going to trade. Now, I will also point out that even though I was specifying the Dow or the S&P 500, you also have uh, specifications within the index. And it might not have uh, preferred the NASDAQ 100 or the QQQs, which is the ETF for the NASDAQ, um, over, let's say, the Spider or the Diamonds. Uh, but you did have some very strong performances in the tech sector. I'll point out that Apple briefly was above the $3 trillion market cap, the first company, publicly traded company, to do so. Very impressive and uh, certainly a strong advance from the pandemic, pre-pandemic, where we were just uh, getting across that one trillion threshold. Uh, you would also see Tesla, uh, one of the new favorites uh, of the past year, uh, managed to uh, charge a really impressive 13, 14% gain on the day, reporting the number of fourth quarter deliveries of its cars, its, its electric vehicles, uh, significantly outpaced expectations. So strong there. But again, this is uh, unique uh, performance. This is not necessarily universal risk reflected performance. Now, if I look outside of these kind of metrics, we would also have uh, some standard volatility uh, as a byproduct of liquidity in other areas. Uh, one of them was very pr uh, notably in the FX market. I'd point out that the dollar uh, managed a very sound bounce. All right. And this is largely a reflection of the Euro USD. It's the principal component of the trade weighted index. Uh, but as you can see with the DX or sorry, the Euro USD, uh, a strong reversal. But it doesn't necessarily uh, speak to a false break reversal, a false break reversal. This actually does qualify technically. Uh, the, the break would have come from, I'm going to have to zoom in here so you can really appreciate it, uh, a descending trend line resistance for which we broke, uh, but ultimately getting above that trend line, which is a wedge, uh, but also just barely closing above the 50 day moving average for the first time in 75 trading days, so it was significant. But the break that came on December the 31st, the day before uh, the New Year's holiday, that really wasn't a liquidity-based play, so it's not going to find follow-through. Subsequently, what would I expect on the first day of trade in the new year? The same. I, I don't expect follow-through. I don't expect the uh, shift or the drive, the volatility, to really be indicative of what the market's intention truly is. Why? There isn't a, a full market to really participate. There was the seasonal liquidity changes. Now, as it comes to the dollar, 
you do have a lot of change that would significantly impact that currency in particular. Why? There has been a lot of uh, window dressing, accounting, whatever you want to call it, year end and year begin flow uh, in capital assets that are dollar denominated. So funds uh, managed by the likes of Fidelity and managed by Black, uh, BlackRock, two of the largest uh, fund managers uh, who had excessive amounts of cash. So they're moving it in and out of markets collectively uh, would have a significant influence on the U.S. dollar, but it's not going to be a lasting influence. They make those moves and then subsequently it's off to the more systemic uh, developments. So with the euro USD, we had the break to the upside. You have a pullback, but ultimately, as you can see it in this pair, it's moved back in range. That is not a... Uh, a supercharged currency cross that you could uh, draw out in an, an expectation of uh, a break with follow through. This is not a trend uh, cusp move. This is actually genuinely moving back into an established range. So it deflates the potential, which is very appropriate because I don't think that we would want to make an assumption on the past 48 hours of trade, Friday, uh, Friday to Monday. Uh, now, this isn't the only move. Uh, you have the Aussie USD, you have the dollar CAD, uh, you have the pound dollar. All right, these are, are these have more interesting technical patterns because they have a little bit more progress, whereas the Euro USD over the past 30 trading days has been very flat, very consolidation oriented. If I look at it on a weekly chart, you can see what it looks like. Um, there's pressure building up, but it's in within a much larger pattern. I do think this has a break potential. I actually wrote an analyst pick on this. Um, I'm looking for a break of either uh, 1400 or 1200 or 112, 114. But I do think that a break to the upside would be more productive, even though it has a plenty of technical boundaries after that threshold. They're probably going to slow it, but it still has that potential. You could play it as a break range kind of hybrid candidate. And it appeals for that because I think the markets are going to be fairly indecisive, especially when it comes to the U.S. dollar, and we kind of work out what fundamentally we're paying attention to. Uh, we have relative growth. We have Omicron and how it impacts the different countries and continents differently. Uh, we have monetary policy deviations, which will uh, take more traction as we get to critical events that are associated to monetary policy, but we really don't have it this week. All right. So it, it fits the circumstance a lot better. Now, in terms of the euro USD range trading is perfectly fine right in the middle of it uh, as it stands now between 112 and 114. Uh, so uh, I wait till it gets to a barrier before I even consider. I do think to the uh, playing against the top side is probably more probability oriented because the descending trend channel that we have here is the prevailing momentum. Uh, even though I do think that break below 112, uh, 112.65 will probably uh, accelerate a possible break below 112. So be very mindful. There's a capacity here to break, uh, but the markets don't really have this, the shape, structure, and fundamental support for it. Now, speaking of fundamentals, uh, things will get a little bit more interesting as we go on through the week. And remember, uh, things will really pick up th through the end of the week. The final 48 hours has the ISM Service Sector Activity Report, which is really indicative of growth for the United States. And then you have the ever market moving non-farm payrolls. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of interest there, whether it's productive and thematic, regardless it's still going to generate uh, expected volatility. In the meantime, in Tuesday's session, things are going to be uh, really euro, dollar, and Canadian dollar centric. Um, so for the euro, you're going to have German retail sales and employment change. That is some very significant data for the largest economy within Europe. I will be watching not just the euro USD. I'll also be watching the euro yen, or sorry, the euro pound, the euro yen, and the euro Swiss. Very interesting currency crosses, which I talked about late last week. But I do think that the ISM manufacturing report is probably going to be the most uh, fundamentally uh, followed because it is indicative of growth, but also cha supply chain constraints and inflation, uh, particularly upstream inflation, factory activity. The green line is factory activity. The red line is service sector activity, which hit a record high for the series uh, in its last update. So we want to see the skew. Uh, which one of these is more indicative of the U.S. economy? That's going to be uh, weighed in on. And is it going to be extrapolated as the health of the U.S. economy, and thereby the health of the global economy? That's something to watch very closely. I'll be watching for dollar volatility, but it's probably going to have more traction when it comes to U.S. equities than it does the U.S. currency. 
I'll also be watching Canadian manufacturing. Uh, Canadian data is actually fairly heavy this week. Uh, I'll be watching dollar CAD as well as pairs like Aussie CAD. Uh, but you have Canadian uh, factory activity, but you also have Canadian employment later in the week as, long as, as well as Canadian trade. So very interesting data, uh, very interesting potential. And there are other things that are certainly worthy of our time keeping tabs on what's happening in China, uh, USDCNH, Shanghai Composite, uh, ongoing Evergrande uncertainty. Actually, Evergrande was halted this past session uh, because of uh, pending news that was potentially uh, market moving. Uh, and we also have uh, outliers like the Turkish Lira, in which uh, President Erdogan uh, came out uh, following a, uh, I think it was a 19 year high in consumer price index uh, and saying he was very sad about the inflation and that they would continue to fight it with rate cuts, which is kind of the opposite of what the Western world does in monetary policy terms. Uh, but keeping tabs on these because it's where a lot of the volatility is not very productive volatility as it can be start and stop and it's very externally driven rather than market derived. But nevertheless, got to keep tabs on it. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there.